Hello and welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics, and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, and I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Bayt. Tonight, we're so excited to be joined by Rabbi David Rosen, the former Chief Rabbi of Ireland, and before that, the Senior Rabbi of the largest Orthodox Jewish congregation in South Africa. He's now the International President of Religions for Peace, and a member of the Chief Rabbinate of Israel's Commission for Interreligious Relations. In this episode, we discuss whether there's an inherent theological value to interreligious dialogue beyond the instrumental merit of diminishing violence and conflict, the role of religious figures in so-called secular spaces like politics, and finally, how interreligious exchange can reconcile with the evangelical mission of certain religions. Before we delve into perhaps a more analytical discussion on the substance of interfaith dialogue, the forms it can take, its interplay with the political, it would be remiss not to hear about your own personal journey and the impetus for your deep engagement in interfaith work, stretching from your work on apartheid, apartheid and social justice in South Africa and during the tenure of your chief rabbinate of, of Ireland, where you founded the Irish Council of Christians and Jews, to now your presidency of the World's Conference of Religions for Peace. I would love you to shed light, light on your path and what motivated you to enter the interfaith space. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be with you. And I must respond to that question, first of all, by giving credit to the home in which I grew up in England. Uh, my father was a famous rabbi, uh, an Orthodox rabbi. In fact, he was the chief rabbi of the Federation of Synagogues. So it was a deeply rooted Jewish home, but at the same time, it was very much open to all um, people and cultures, and in fact saw that as a necessary uh, engagement to be truly in synchronization with the best and the most noble of our own heritage. So uh, I could t tell you much more about that, but I think I've got to give them, if you like, copyright on anything I've been able to achieve <laughs> since then. Um, I, I, um, my wife and I arrived in South Africa. We were very young. I came initially as a student chaplain and then was made, in the words of the movie, The Godfather, an offer I couldn't refuse. And I was became the rabbi at a ridiculously young age of what was the largest Orthodox Jewish congregation in the world at the time in Seapoint, Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, for us, it was very important that if we were going to stay on in South Africa, that we would be engaged in the issues. In fact, I would go so far as to say that a religion that doesn't address the issues in its environment, especially its social environment, isn't worthy of the name. That inevitably meant taking a stand on the racial oppression in South Africa, uh, on apartheid. And this was not a simple matter because at the time, and we're talking now in the 70s, it was a police state. And the Jewish community, which anyway, as Jewish communities all over the world, even when they live in security, still live with trauma and are actually uh, easy to uh, highlight that trauma or to exacerbate it. And therefore, there was a lot of fear that if I was publicly speaking out against the authorities, that anybody who didn't protest against it would automatically be incriminated, especially amongst the older members of the community. But all in all, I would say I got great support. But it was very important for me not only to be seen to be engaged in the struggle against apartheid, but to be able to bring my community in on that. And one of the few ways you could engage other communities across the racial divides that the government imposed was through religion. And generally speaking, they would be a bit nervous of touching religious institutions. And so I came to interfaith relations out of a commitment to social justice. And I met with uh, leaders of the different Christian denominations and of the Muslim authorities in Cape Town. The head of the Muslim Judicial Council there was Sheikh Abu Bakr Najjar, uh, 
And he was amongst those, together with uh, the cardinal, the, especially the archbishop, the Anglican archbishop, and others, with whom I founded the Council of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, the Interfaith Forum, we called it, uh, with the initials IF, with a double F, if only. And so that was really, for me, an eye-opener, because I, I came to it as essentially, as I say, as a vehicle, not as an end in itself. But I discovered that, first and foremost, the people I was meeting, um, Muslims and Christians, were amazingly ignorant about me. I assumed, you know, if your religion is in some way based upon mine, in some way, you would have some knowledge about it. But the knowledge that they had, if you can call it knowledge, was very often distorted, stereotypes, misunderstandings. I realized it was enormously important for me to engage these leaders of their communities, these multiplicators, so that I would be able to combat these negative images and to be able to give them a, what I understood to be a true understanding of who I am and what my heritage is. But as I engaged with people, I discovered something else, and that was they were not only terribly ignorant about me, I was pretty ignorant about them too. And if I want to be understood, I need to understand. And therefore, this whole process was enormously enlightening for me and enormously enriching. And I became hooked on it. In other words, I see a value, and I'm happy to elaborate that a little bit later if you wish, uh, interfaith engagement as something of a value in and of itself, um, not simply as a means to an end. But the means was very important. So I realized that this, if we want to combat prejudice, then we've got to work together. And if we believe in certain values that we share, then if we are going to be true to them, we've got to work together to be greater than the sum of our different parts. Because to affirm those values and not work together with those that share them, in a sense, is to betray those values. So uh, I have many stories I can tell of my engagement there in South Africa, but it set me uh, on the path so that in the end, the government got rid of me in South Africa. They didn't renew my visa. I was considered to be a subversive force there. And uh, my next position was as chief rabbi of Ireland. And there, as a predecessor of mine, Lord Jakobowicz, uh, said, 95% uh, of Ireland is Catholic, 5% is Protestant, and I'm chief rabbi of the rest. Uh, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there's a certain truism, which is that if you're going to be effective as a chief rabbi, it's not just enough to be able to mold your own little community and to be able to take care of its needs. You are representing it to the society at large, especially then, because when I was in Ireland, it was a radically different society from what it is today. Then it was a deeply religious society. And as one who could have easily, from an age point of view, could have been a son of the other hierarchs within Ireland of the Cardinal and the Archbishop, uh, the media then, if a society that was looking to how to forge its way between tradition and modernity, seemed to see me as a, a somebody of great interest, and I was disproportionately on the media and within part and parcel, therefore in public fora within that particular society. So uh, there, uh, the engagement with religions was part of what I understood my mission to be. It was also the beginning, uh, I also had the, uh, there was a, the, the nascent um, Muslim communities, both uh, Sunni and Shia, were just beginning at that time there, and I had those initial contacts there, though my main interfaith contacts were with the Christian community. Incidentally, I actually wanted contact also with Hare Krishna there and help get them their charitable status under Irish law at the time. Um, but uh, my wife and I uh, uh, saw ourselves only as temporary sojourners in the Jewish diaspora, as periods of service. We met here in Israel, we got married here, and we saw our destiny as here and intended to be back here while our children were still young enough to totally acculturate into this environment and both language as well as the other aspects of society. And so we only, uh, we limited our stay. In fact, the island, the island had asked me to com commit myself for 15 years. We said, you know, we'll come if you want us for five. And we were there for five years and a month, I think, and then returned back to Israel. And for me, it was very important uh, returning here to be engaged in interfaith here even more than before. Uh, it's all very well to be involved in interfaith relations when you are a minority, where there is obvious strategic interest in uh, ensuring your own welfare. It is, I think, much more critically important on uh, in terms of moral principle to be engaged in that where you are a majority, 
and where you are concerned with the welfare of those minorities and are trying to advance that within your own particular society. So I got heavily involved in interfaith relations here, which of course is not just interfaith relations, it's intercultural and inevitably it's political. You cannot di divest these elements here from one another. And uh, as a, uh, in Ireland, because uh, the chief rabbi is, was really the state figure of the Jewish community, uh, all other visitors that would come from the Jewish community of international standing would tend to call on the chief rabbi. In fact, incidentally, when I was there, the chief rabbi who was considered to be a state figure also received new ambassadors who would call on the cardinal and the archbishop and the chief rabbi as well. But as a result, I like, became known within the international Jewish field. And when we came back to live here in Jerusalem, the Jewish organizations came along and asked me to represent them in this field in what I was doing anyway. They simply asked me to, to represent them. And so that led to my becoming uh, the liaison to the Vatican of the Anti-Defamation League. And then uh, the American Jewish Committee, uh, which like many American organizations has global pretensions, uh, came and asked me to represent it in the field of interfaith relations. And as a result, then made me, if you like, its ambassador for Judaism to the religions of the world, which until COVID meant I was traveling maybe as much as 50% of the time around the world. Uh, thank, thank God for the modern technology, which has enabled us to cope with this particular crisis, but also I think has changed our, our way of functioning. And even though it will never completely replace not just the eye-to-eye -eye contact, but if you like the breath-to-breath -breath contact, it nevertheless will certainly change our lifestyles to a, a significant degree. And um, so uh, I continue to benefit from the gifts of one experience of another in the course of my life, opening up the gates of the next stage. Uh, I've not, Almost nothing that I do and have done has been at my direct initiative. Yes, I've had to walk in through the gates, but Providence, the Almighty has facilitated that uh, my opportunity to move from one stage to the to the other, for which I am profoundly grateful. Thank you so much for that tableau of non-linear sequence in your life that, as you say, is, is joint by the divine providence. And I wanted to actually pick up on the comment that you made about interfaith being inherently good, about being something that should be pursued and ought to be pursued in an end in itself rather than the more instrumental conception. And this question is posed to both you and Syed about given the fact that interfaith is usually instrumentalized, particularly in political contexts, seen as a form of political rapprochement, why ought religions individually, religions collectively aspire to interfaith as a final goal, as a final end, and see value in that objective in and of itself as a telos rather than as an instrument? So first of all, let me state the obvious, and that is that what's used by the term interfaith encompasses many different forms of engagement. Personally, actually, I'm not terribly excited about the term interfaith. I, I think actually that reflects more of a Christian bias and would prefer the term interreligious. And I understand that in the Western world, that is seen as less an attractive a term. I, I understand all the nuances involved, but I think that religion is more than a faith. And precisely because it embraces so much of, of culture and of identity and so many different components, it has to be teased out as to what it is in any particular given context that is taking place. And there are areas, as I indicated in the past, of where there could be social issues, there could be environment, environmental issues, there could be issues of poverty, issues of so many areas which must be religious engagements on it, which are not necessarily to do with the bilateral or even multilateral relationships directly in and of themselves. And then on the other side, there's what's often referred to as the dialogue of life and just people getting to know one another or as a, a, a former colleague, a late colleague of mine used to say, tea and sympathy is not something to be sneezed at. And very often because of the barriers that exist so many within societies, it's really important to facilitate those kind of engagements simply to break down because to be a victim of stereotypes and misunderstanding, misrepresentation is to do harm to yourself, let alone to the other. So there are very important reasons just for that kind of social engagement to take place in and of itself. 
But the higher goal actually was something that struck me when I started this journey in South Africa. Uh, as I met these wonderful people, Christian and Muslim leaders and Hindu leaders, but mainly Christian and Muslim leaders, uh, I've posed a question that I had never ever thought of before. And it's stunning that I had never thought of it. Um, uh, even after I was already in a position as a rabbi. And that was, what is the meaning of this religious diversity? Uh, I had grown up, yes, in a multicultural society um, and uh, where there were different religions, but I had never seriously sought to address the meaning of the existence of other religions. And I suppose like many people in the course of history, I saw myself as an adherent of the most right religion, and others were walking to some degree in less intense light. Let us use that term rather than a negative term of any kind of darkness. And I, as I met these wonderful people, I realized that, that that was ridiculous. That was insulting. And it was to deny the complexity of reality. And I faced a question which was uh, suddenly hit me as being such an obvious question with such surprise, which is, if God has created us in all our diversity and therefore relates to us in all our diversity, something especially the Abrahamic religions affirm so profoundly, then there must be diverse ways of relating to the divine. God is more than any one religion. Indeed, to suggest that any one religion can encapsulate the totality of the divine, if I didn't dislike the word so much, I would call it a heresy because you're limiting the, 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 the unlimitedness of the divine potential. And no one religion, therefore, not only can encapsulate it, no one experience can experience anything like it. We are only fragmentary experience of the totality of the divine. There's only a limited amount we can ever grasp. And we can never go through different religious experiences of the different intensity of religions because that's both not to be authentic, but it's simply not, we're not capable of doing it with the fullness of that intensity. And therefore, we need to be true to our own particularity. However, that comes out because particular religions emerge out of different cultural and historical contexts. But when we encounter the other, especially for the religions that affirm the other is in some way a manifestation of the divine presence, we are encountering the divine. And when we encounter the other out of the sense, his or her sense of the divine in her or his life and their own religious experience, then the encounter with the divine beyond the boundaries of our own religious tradition is even greater. So the interreligious encounter, if it's really authentic and truly deep, is in itself a greater discovery of the divine presence. It is a religious engagement in and of itself. It is an enormous gift. Yes, there are some very important roles that religion can play in overcoming conflict and facilitating peace building. And all of our religions teach the importance of peace as a goal, as a value, indeed, even that God's name is peace, and therefore that we are actually bringing the divine into the world through the promotion of peace, as well as all the other issues of shared values that I referred to before. But the, I, 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 I bristle when those talk about not only, not just dialogue, or more than dialogue. Dialogue is not something in which, if it's really true, there's anything more than, because it is the encounter with the divine presence in and of itself. Syed, if you would like to contribute on this as well, and any of those strands, whether they resonate or whether there is any form of difference in your perception. Well, I'm actually enjoying this, um, this dialogue, this discussion, and I'd really want to listen more, actually, to what the rabbi has to say on this. Um, but because I have to put in my two pence worth, um, I will do. And, you know, I see my own journey in terms of interfaith as really an evolution. Um, growing up in a very small bubble and the sheer diaspora as such, um, that we've also gone through many centuries of oppression. So therefore, I'd say about 50 to 60 years ago when we started to come to the United Kingdom, uh, I'm born in the United Kingdom as well, and we had these small pockets of communities um, and culture played a huge role. And with these small pockets, we kept ourselves to ourselves because we felt that there would be an imminent attack from outside 
And so therefore we were very insular. And I think the, the formula for catastrophe is actually being insular in many ways. And what happens really is that we become reactive when we're insular. You know, I remember not too long ago reading something that Rabbi Sachs had said, that when a community feels oppressed, two things happen, they become insular and they become reactive. And I felt that that's the story of our community, at least in the United Kingdom. However, after the second or third generation, when we became culturally English or Scottish or Irish, I found that we could relate to our neighbor. And I think much of it is to do with that language barrier, to do with cultures, to do with understanding the other. And we fear that which we don't know. So I guess really interfaith is something for, at least from a sheer perspective, for the second or third generations. People who speak the language, people who know the culture. You've been to school with a particular person of diversity. And so the natural evolution, therefore, is, is that in this world of mass communication, the internet, all the information is there on the tip of your fingers. But then there's a lot of misinformation. You know, today, I would say if you were to type Shia, the perception, first thing that comes into Google probably is somebody who looks like a terrorist or somebody who's bleeding. And that's really not what we're about. I think the biggest fallacy today is that people think, okay, Shiism, they're all Iranian. It's not the case. Actually, there's more Shias in India and Pakistan than there are in Iran and Iraq. So, so I think that we need to have this dialogue because there's a lot of misinformation. And each Shia is different from, you know, if you look at the school of Najaf, it's completely different to the school of Om, which is completely different to maybe the schools in Jabal Amal in Lebanon, which may be different to a school in Damascus, which may be completely different to the school of Karbala and Karbala and Najaf are only 80 kilometers apart. So there's great diversity there. And I think that's really what my pathway within this road of interreligious dialogue or interfaith dialogue has really been from being exclusive as a child to becoming more inclusive, to be able to understand the diversity. And as the rabbi rightly said for us, monotheism in terms of the absolute God, his children, or you could say this image of God within creation is really the diversity of God. God is absolute. There's no way I believe that we can get to God in this absolute nature of finite. But God manifested. And everything around you that you see, these vessels that you see around us, these vessels of light are a dimension of that light of God. And so through interaction, through having conversations, through understanding a different perspective, actually, I find that it enriches me. It makes me stronger in my own faith. And I've also seen this with, for example, let's say we're doing scriptural reasoning, which actually comes out of textual reasoning um, that you find within the Jewish faith. So we have something known as scriptural reasoning. And let's say you have a passage of the Old Testament. Just to see Christians, Jews, Muslims have a different opinion on a particular text that they will agree on from different angles in itself is enriching, to see the different dimensions. And that really has worked to enrich my own belief in God, my own understanding, my own kind of monotheism, if you were to say. And so I think that religious dialogue is very important. Now, where, where you have theological dialogue, I don't feel that that's the solution for everyone. I think that's the solution for an elite, but not for everyone. But where religion does contribute, I believe, in these dialogues is the social element, be it through mitzvah, or if you're a Hindu, through seva, or if you're a Muslim, through khidmah, or charity, whatever it may be. But I think the compassion that religion teaches is phenomenal, and that's something which brings all of us together. I remember initially coming into this dialogue, there were people from my community to say, well, you've been sucked into a government system whereby they want to pacify you and so forth. And we faced a lot of negativity. And I remember for a period of six months, I was attacked for having met a particular person. Um, and they were saying, oh, this person's so evil and this, that, and the other. And I said, look, he's a religious figure. Get to know him. There's a lot of misconception that you have. And it's only through dialogue that we can remove that. Mm. And so... I really do believe in dialogue. You have dialogue with people who have a difference of opinion from you. If I was a carbon copy of somebody else, there's no need for a dialogue. But dialogue is there and it's important. It's, it's in the Quran, you see the life of the Prophet Muhammad having dialogue with people. And that's what I say to many Shias who have an issue having dialogue with others, that listen, your Prophet had dialogue. He had dialogue with Jews, Christians, and atheists. It's not a bad I don't thing. Need to dialogue, the text, the text calls you are the only religion that actually has a religious text. 
that calls for the imperative of dialogue. Dialogue. <laughs> that we are. In terms of, uh, of the surah, uh, what is it? Um, uh, what, 49, 13, we've created you from single male and female, made you into tribes and nations in order that you may know one another. Know one another, exactly. So you, you actually are the leaders, for, from a religious point of view, you should be the leaders in terms of dialogue. And we should be, exactly. Are we actually leading on this? I don't think so. And I think, and I think you know, it takes for somebody like yourself to point out to the Muslim community, hang on a minute, this is part of your faith. And here we are. That's an advantage and a benefit of dialogue. You've pointed out the obvious when today people are very insular. And that's an advantage. And that's the image of God. Now, when you've said that, that is God, in my opinion, working through you to give us as Muslims a message. You need to have more dialogue. And I think we need to do that, be it Sunni Shia dialogue, be it Abrahamic dialogue or wider dialogue. It's very important. There are things that you'll see from your perspective that I may not see. It's the same Quran, and we're reading the same text, but you've just highlighted something very profound. And I think that's, here we are, dialogue is working. And I wish we could take this forward. But I want to listen to you more. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to... I, I would just like, no, thank you very much. I want to listen to, and I want to listen to you. So we've got, we, we, we've got to be gracious towards one another. So the, uh, I would just like to go back to something that Michelle mentioned. Um, I, I want to... Uh, point out that there is a danger, of course, in dialogue. And the danger is that very often we find that the people engaged in interreligious dialogue uh, are not necessarily those that are most authentically rooted within their own tradition. And very often it becomes dialogue at the lowest common denominator. Now, again, I don't want to knock any kind of dialogue because just the human encounter, I believe, profoundly has a value in and of itself. But I think we have a responsibility within our own communities, first and foremost, to affirm something uh, you said, Michelle, at the opening, and that is that we must uh, um, be cognizant and celebrating of our differences and that we need to know, therefore, what our traditions teach properly, so that we may engage one another out of knowledge and not out of ignorance, and thereby enrich one another accordingly. Um, this has not always been the case, and very logically. So as an Orthodox rabbi, obviously my preference um, is not necessarily denominational, but it is for those who are um, devoutly practicing. And therefore, I'm not so happy that, even though I'm grateful in one sense, that the history of interreligious engagement from the Jewish community has overwhelmingly come from the more progressive and liberal strands of Judaism, uh, and very often from elements that have not been, from my perspective, adequately rooted within their own particular heritage. Of course, even the reform uh, movements uh, and the liberal movements, progressive movements themselves have become more traditional over recent decades. And I would say their leadership has reflected a, a more well-educated uh, rabbinic tradition. But for me, I'm very passionate about Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Jewish um, uh, uh, members of the community and above all its rabbinic leadership being actively engaged, and that is changing. That's changing in, in recent times. As I say again, in some ways, we've got to thank our liberal colleagues for leading the way, but I'm, I'm glad that there is more and more of it for all the reasons we mentioned above before. But it's really important to, to uh, not to lose that sense of specificity, or that sense of that each one has their own special character. You may be familiar with the wonderful three guidelines of the late Bishop Christopher Stendhal, who, of course, was the head of the Divinity School at Harvard at one time. And uh, he mentions uh, the, the first two are very obvious ones. Always try to understand the way the other understands himself, not the way third parties have portrayed them. Uh, always uh, look, view the other community by the best that is within it. Don't judge it by its worst. But the third uh, rule that he leaves is a beautiful idea. He says, leave room for holy envy. It's a beautiful idea. When we meet one another, it's very nice to say, oh, you have this and we have this, we have these commonalities. Isn't that wonderful that what we share and to celebrate what we share? That's good. 
But there is nothing disloyal in being some, seeing something very special and beautiful in the other that is not part of your own particular tradition. And to be able to celebrate those differences as well, that I think is also important. But that requires a level and gets back to something which side you mentioned before. It requires a level of self-confidence. It requires not being victims of your own historical or contemporary traumas and fears and to have enough self-confidence to be able to admire the other. There are so many paths I could take from the discussion that has just ensued. I'm going to pick one specific one that was mentioned earlier before we dovetail into the political, which is what I'm hearing is a convergence to multiplicity, that there is something divinely resplendent about multiplicity in faith because there are many ways of appraising God in the same sense that there are many ways that God portrays, manifests uh, himself. And what I wanted to pick up on and press both of you on specifically is the role and responsibility of evangelization within your faiths. Because what I think is the main critical juncture, the, the inflection point, is potentially when the religious will, religious preference, religious observation, practice has been formed, it is much easier to observe that and then meet it tolerate or accept and converge. But in the formation of that religious will, in the sense that another religion is disseminating itself at the expense of your own, or that you are perhaps not heeding an obligation by promulgating your own religion, this seems to be at the piece or at the core of many of the disputes in that not only is religion receptive to preferences which already exist and are instantiated, but it is formative of them in the first place. There is a role for evangelization. There is a role for sermon, for preaching. And so I wanted to sort of link this into the strand of self-confidence that both of you touch on, that it sort of requires a level of self-confidence that seems to be a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You only have that self-confidence when you have more people in your religion, when potentially you don't feel like a minority in the same sense, when you don't feel like you have to conform to certain standards or that you're pushed into a certain corner of that society. And I was wondering on, for, for both of your opinions on that specific juncture where religions lie, not only in being responsive once religious preferences have been set, but in informing them and where you see the, the need to intervene within your own faiths and, and ensure that people are, for example, part of your denomination or part of your faith? So I think your question is more of a question for Imam Razawi than it is for me, uh, your or at least the way you formulated it. I think it's a very important question and challenge, and I think your description of the psychology involved is very valid for religions which do have a universal evangelical, if you like, aspiration. If a religion would ideally like everybody to be part and parcel of their religion, then there is a very significant challenge that you are highlighting. And that is a challenge I think, I think is a challenge for Islam, and I certainly think it's a challenge for Christianity. Now, from a historical point of view, there might be those that say that once upon a time, Judaism might have been in the same, in the same situation. But certainly for the last 2,000 years, we have not. There is, a, I would actually be very interested to hear whether there is a particular Shia perspective, precisely because of Shiism's own experience of persecution and of marginalization. I would imagine that it's distinctly possible that there is a kind of a universal a universalism within Shia Islam that is not quite the same as a universalism within Sunni Islam, but I don't know enough. But from a Jewish perspective, whether perforce, and I, but I would say it's not just a matter of perforce, and I'll illustrate why I think it's inherent. Certainly for the last 2,000 years, we have not sought, uh, aspired, for a world that is all Jewish. Indeed, the visions of the prophets, so that's taking us back at least 2,500 years, is of a world, if I take the image of Isaiah, in which uh, different nations go up to the mountain of the Lord in the messianic vision. Nation does not lift up against all nation. It's not a world in which we are denationalized, in which identities are divested but in which these different characters live constructively with one another. And 
while Judaism is a, a religion um, that is open to conversion uh, and well is obliged to welcome the proselytes uh, with special love, it does not seek to proselytize. And if somebody comes before the rabbinic court and says, I want to convert to Judaism, the first reaction of the three judges on the court will be, you don't need to. God loves you as a good Muslim, as a good Christian. Be true to your own particular heritage. Uh, why take on yourself more obligations than you need to take as a, 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 a a sincere human being who believes in the divine and wants to lead a moral life. We believe that there are only seven principles of the universal Noahide code, which are necessary for anyone to observe to be able to be guaranteed their place in paradise and their, like, their ticket through the pearly gates. If you become Jewish, then there are all these additional obligations you take on and a more onerous and demanding way of life. What do you need to do that for? But if the individual says, yes, I know, but I still want to do that, then we are obliged to say, well, no, that you're not just taking on yourself a religious way of life. You're joining a community. You're taking on that community's history. You're taking on its responsibilities. You may love Judaism, but you might not like Jews. Are you sure that this is what you really want to do? But if the individual says, yes, I know, but I want to be part of the community and I want to be part of it, as well as in a religious way of life, then we have to accept that individual with special love, and that is the process. Now, I think this is a particularly modern approach, because in a sense, it's a kind of multi-religious, multicultural religiosity that says there isn't one path, and it doesn't have to be that one is better than another. Now, this is particularly important for Judaism, because Judaism's religious way of life is bound up, as I mentioned before, with its historical experience. Now, there are universal principles, as I mentioned already, which Judaism aspires for the whole of humanity. And in that messianic age, all humanity will live in the knowledge of God and follow that basic moral code. But let us take, for example, one aspect of that way of life, the Passover. What is a Passover is a festival. It happens to be a spring festival celebrating the season, but it's celebrating a historical event. It's celebrating the exodus from Egypt. And therefore, it's celebrating the idea that people should not be oppressed. People should be free from the controls of political authority so that they can develop their potential and relate to the divine each without the trammels of anybody else's controls. Now, that principle that people should be free to worship God and free to develop their potential is a universal principle. And therefore, we want everybody to be able to celebrate that. But Jews celebrate this particular principle through recalling those historical events in the lives of the children of Israel. And as a result of those events, we have particular precepts which require us to eat unleavened bread at this particular time over seven days or eight days in the diaspora where there is no leaven around because we remember that the children of Israel didn't have time for the dough that they had prepared to rise and therefore they ate this unleavened bread. We, are, we eat bitter herbs at the Seder meal at the first evening or second evening if you're also in the diaspora of the festival to remember the bitterness of this oppression. Now, to ask a Hindustani or an Iceland Eskimo or somebody to be able to eat matzah, unleavened bread, or marah, bitter herbs, in order to be able to celebrate universal human freedom because somebody else's ancestors came out of Egypt three and a half thousand or four thousand years ago, whatever it was, that's cultural imperialism. Why on earth should somebody have to do that in order to celebrate a universal value? Therefore, from a Jewish perspective, because religion is not just faith, because it is the form and structure of a whole experience over the course of history that has developed, and especially in a Jewish context, born out of a people's history, being a religion that comes out of a people and a people that comes out of a religion, it cannot be imperialist in its approach towards uh, the rest of the world. And therefore, I think provides a model for what you might call theological humility that will recognize, perforce by virtue of its own cultural character, the limits of its own capacities, and therefore should develop as a result respect for others. But because we have been oppressed most of our history, and because our experience of the other has generally been negative, 
And because people tend to remember the negative more easily than they remember the positive, our experiences of our encounters, not only within the pagan world, but even within the religions of the world, has generally been an, an, a negative one. And that, of course, is part and parcel of the source, at least a, a significant part of the source of hostility that I've encountered with my own community with regards to this work to engage and to celebrate religious diversity in our relationships with other communities. So with the case of the Jewish community, it's not so much the challenge to the universal vision, because that universal vision actually embraces the diversity in and of itself. The challenge is how to be able to see yourself as, uh, um, uh, and see the world as a world with which you are constructively engaged, because the uh, mindset of so many Jews over the vast majority of our history, and still, as I indicated at the beginning, many of us even living in an open society are still victims of that mentality, is to see the world as a world that is hostile to us and which we have to preserve ourselves despite the world around us and not in relation to it. And I see my, if you like, mission within my community to be able to develop a greater sense of our own religiosity in relation to the world and not despite the world. Said, I'd love to hear your response particularly to the Shia vision of universalism in contrast to the Sunni and how that interacts with the lack of what has been described here as, as imperialism religiously on, on behalf of the Jewish faith. I also want to complicate it one more strand, if I may, which is with the emergence of the political phenomenon of the Wilayat and Faki under Ayatollah Khomeini and how that intersects with this very sense of theological humility versus what seems to be a burgeoning tendency to relate the political and the religious to entwine them rather than to see it as under religion, there exists faith, there exists a political realm and multiplicity abounds underneath. Whatever happens, happens under that multiplicity. So I'd love to hear your perspective on all of those virtues. That's a fully loaded and fully packed question, which let's start now unpacking slowly and slowly. So either way, it's going to get me into trouble somewhere along the line. But let's let's start off with her. We, we have... Uh, say an imam, um, Imam Hussein, who is the standard bearer for universal freedom, um, a standard bearer for the oppressed. And in a couple of days' time, we'll be commemorating the month of Muharram, which is the first month of the Islamic calendar, but it also highlights the sacrifice of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, was martyred by the caliph of the time, Yazid, uh, 72 of his men against 30,000 who had come in from Syria and Iraq and had basically surrounded him in a place called Karbala and had slaughtered him with a six-month-old baby and the granddaughters of the Prophet were taken hostage. So this in itself tells you how bloody the history of Islam is that 50 years after the death of the Prophet, his grandson is slaughtered and the Prophet's granddaughters are basically shackled. And for 40 days, they paraded from Kufa, which is in Iraq, all the way to Damascus. That when the Muslims find out who these women are, there's essentially a revolution that takes place from a speech of one woman. And that woman happens to be Sayyida Zainab, who's the granddaughter of the Prophet. So the entire collapse of Yazid's dynasty comes because of a woman. And for Shias, the central role of a woman is very important. If you look at three generations, you look at the Prophet Muhammad, his wife, Khadija, and then after that, you look at his daughter, Fatima, and her husband, Ali. And then after that, if you look at his granddaughter, Zainab, within that, there's an equality um, of responsibility. And for 1,400 years ago, for an Arab society that was selling women on the market, that's quite profound. The savior of Islam, according to at least the Shia denomination, has come in the form of Khadija and her wealth and her commitment to her husband. And that opens up many different dimensions for Muslims. That today, when certain cultural Muslims in certain parts of the world do not allow their wives to go out of the house to work, 1,400 years ago, Khadija was a very affluent and a very successful businesswoman. And then after that, Fatima and her defense of Ali. And then after that, Zainab, in preserving the message of Imam Hussein, where Yazid has said that, look, we've destroyed Hussein, 
We've killed every single person who was related to Hussein. There's no way this message can come out. We've surrounded him. We've killed him, 72 of his men. There's no way this message is going to come out. The message did come out. And in the words of Saddam, when he killed Shahid Sadr in 79, he said, I'm going to kill his sister as well. Because if I don't kill his sister, another Karbala is going to take place where his sister is going to go across Iraq and to preach against me. And so he killed his sister. That's where the legacy comes from. And in a couple of days' time, those 10 days of Muharram are going to be there, where this universal movement then takes place. Now, the West really doesn't know about Imam Hussein as much as the East does. Gandhi's entire movement, if you look at what Gandhi says, his inspiration was from Imam Hussein. If you look at people of the subcontinent, why? Because Imam Hussein led really what is a movement against Yazid, which was peaceful. In fact, it wasn't even a movement. It was really a protest, not of the sword, but a protest of consciousness. To say that I'm not here to cause trouble, but the one thing I'm here to do is to protest that what's happening is wrong. Yazid wanted the allegiance of Imam Hussein. He said, if he doesn't give allegiance, kill him in Medina. What did Imam Hussein say? He says, look, if it's going to cause my bloodshed, I'll move away from Medina, which is really my home, which is where my grandfather is buried, and I'll move. And he goes on Hajj. When he goes on Hajj, he's the first ever Haji who didn't complete the Hajj. He says, I'm going to move now because they've sent people to kill me because I don't want there to be any bloodshed, but I'm not going to give my allegiance to Yazid. For me to give allegiance to Yazid is for me to give allegiance to a tyrant, an oppressor, and I'm not going to do that. But I'm not here to fight. So he goes towards Iraq, and one tradition says, and it's found deeply rooted within the Sunni tradition, that he even said, I'll go to India if I have to. I'll move, and I'll move as far away as I have to. Now go to those 72 people who supported him. Look at the pluralism there. There was a Jew there, there were ethnic Jews present, and there were Christians present in the army of Imam Hussein. You could say army, but in the French circle of Imam Hussein. 72 people is not an army against 30,000. So there were people there, who Imam Hussein didn't force to convert, but they were there for monotheism. And they accepted that Hussein was making a stand for monotheism, so they supported him. And you know, for the, the famous Christian, John the Christian, who was an Ethiopian black slave, who, who Imam Hussein then freed, brought him over to his side, and then after that, whose blood is shed in Karbala in support of Imam Hussein, tells you there's no force there. Shiism doesn't have a legacy of evangelical, evangelicalism as such. Uh, you don't find that within the Shia format. For us, it's more important to preserve the wholesome message, the truth, and then after that, to share the truth. But what you don't find is that you don't find Shia standing on a street corner trying to convert people. That's not the way it is. There are certain denominations of Islam that may have that, and you know, all respect to them, if that's what the interpretation of Islam is. But ours isn't like that. You know, we look at a verse of the Quran that says that the righteous will inherit the earth. Uh, and it co quotes David, in fact, the righteous will inherit. But that will be, as emphasized in the messianic stage where the Mahdi comes, the Mashiach or the Messiah comes. And then he opens up, I guess, a new level of consciousness and understanding, takes humanity to a higher level where they accept it. If I force something on someone, that doesn't change a person that actually develops resentment. But if a person begins to understand, that individual then becomes a greater individual, a more connected individual. And you know, the example I generally give is, you know, you, we know lying is bad, but people still lie. Why? Because it's, in, it's, it's as information is there, but it hasn't seeped into the heart. And what Imam Hussein did, he starts a process whereby he said, look, you've got to change the hearts of the people. And that was the message of Imam Hussein the ability to change the heart of the person. We're not here to convert a person, we're here to change their hearts. It's even greater than that. A revolution comes from revolve, right? Revolve what, essentially, the heart. Inqalab in Islam, inqalab basically means revolution, it comes from qalb. Qalb is the heart, qalaba, to rotate the heart. So it's not forcing people, it's actually changing their hearts that's important. And so here we are, in 10 days time or so, when we're commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, it's actually a commemoration of changing the hearts of people, how to become the king of hearts. And that's the important thing. And this is why you'll find today that up to recently, there used to be communities in Baghdad of Jews, Isfahan, and you go to Iran and places like that, because over periods, I say over centuries, 
the Jewish community, the Sephardi community, did feel that they could come and take respite. They could come and have security in Shia places, in Shia countries. Now accelerate forward, and as you've mentioned, you mentioned the revolution that takes place in 79. When the revolution takes place, it's an interpretation of a concept known as wilayat al-faqih, right? The wilayat, the guardianship of the jurist. It comes out of this, that in the time of occultation, before the coming of the Mehdi, human beings still have responsibilities. Who teaches them the law? Because remember, there's two things. There's theology, there's dogma, and then there's law. The job of a marja, ayatollah, mujtahid, is to actually tell you the law, not actually to tell you your theological standing. That's for you to go and investigate. There is no taqalid, there's no following when it, comes to, when it comes to theology. Every Muslim has a responsibility to understand God, monotheism in their own way. And they do. Yes, we have books of theology. You will find that there's a template, but that's just a template. It's for you to go and evaluate, to learn, look at the mystical teachings, look at the hadith, look at the, the dogma, look beyond that, make your own opinion of what God is. So yes, we have a dogma, but it's beyond that. No one Muslim will have the same belief in God in the absolute. Why? Because we've all got differences of opinions. We have different understandings. We have different intellectual capacities. And so therefore we'll have different opinions when it comes to God. So the job of a jurist is actually to do with law. So therefore this concept of well, it actually comes with a legal route. That in the occultation of the 12th Imam, does a jurist have guardianship and here Ayatollah Khomeini interpreted it to say that in the occultation of the imam, we as the jurist have the legal role of the imam. And here you find that there is huge debate amongst the jurists. His 10 years that he spent in Najaf, the scholars of Najaf had a big problem with that. They said, how can a fallible jurist have realistically the power of an imam who gains, I wouldn't say revelation, but whose intellect is connected to the divine intellect. And it's a bit of philosophy. And as you know, Ayatollah Khomeini was a philosopher and he was a mystic. Had he not gone into the political realm, many more Muslims would be studying his philosophy and his mysticism. So I think in, in some ways, him going into the political realm has actually marginalized some of the work that he's done. He had a good understanding of Avicenna, Maimonides, and then after that, Mullah Sadra and so forth. And he had a huge understanding of Ibn Arabi and the other mystical uh, personalities within Islam and across the religions. And that's taken a backseat and nobody really studies that today. The Western world really has no idea of his philosophy or his mysticism, why? Right? Because of the politics. So when this system does come forward, what happens there is that it's an interpretation. It's, a, it's a, essentially, it is a theory. It's a theory which is built on the theory of other um, jurists. So whether we go back slightly to look at Ayatollah Na'ani or for, before that, Sheikh Ansari, and then it goes all the way back to Mufid. So it's an evolution. It's a school in and of itself, but it's a school of jurisprudence. So as is jurisprudence, it's interpretation. How, do, how does one extract a ruling? You look at the Quran, you look at the principles, you look at the Hadith, you look at the principles. You take those principles, you contextualize those principles, and here we have it. Through a process of contextualization, that means that the same fatwa may not always hold in every time and every era, because there's a contextualization which takes place, and maybe 20, 30, 50 years down the line, there may be an evolution. There may be, may be an evolution of thought. So remember, we have principles, and because, again, within Islam, these principles are meant to be there until the last day. So therefore, we don't have 10,000 volumes of everything to do until the last day. You have principles. And it's for the jurist to extract from those principles law. And so therefore you may see change and it may happen. And th this period of coronavirus has actually showed us that. And to give you an example, you know, we have to, sh you know, when it comes to dead bodies, for example, we have to wash them in a particular way, shroud them, read the rights over the, and because of the reservations and all the issues that we've had, we've had to do ijtihad again. Ijtihad basically means innovate in many ways. Um, and it's completely different from what we've been seeing in the last maybe 100 years or so, because we've not faced something like this. You know, for example, there was a big dilemma amongst Muslims. Women, so when we go to the mosque, our purpose of going is for congregational prayer. For private prayer, you can pray at home. So let's say, for example, Friday comes along, you've got five or 10 people. So now we do a congregational prayer. Question is this, 
Muslims stand shoulder to shoulder. That's how we pray. We're being told that you have to have two meters distance. And within the Sunni sect, it was fine. They were able then to observe that. But within the Shia, it's a huge issue. How do we separate two meters to come and pray? What, what, why, why is it a bigger issue in the Shia? It's, it's a bigger issue because the door of Ijtihad is still open. And the contextual... It's a issue. So Sorry? Ijtihad should, it should be there for a lesser issue because therefore you can adapt more easily. That's the issue. Adapting then would mean going away from the, 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 the root of it or the spirit of it. So when a person does do ijtihad, they've got to be wholesome to the, to the messages of the imams 1,100 ah, years ago. It, In other words, there needs to be a, a jurisprudential a justification for it. There must be a jurisprudential justification. It must be wholesome because otherwise then with the door of ijtihad open, and if you are just contextualizing and moving forward without any justification, you're actually going far away from what we would say the asal, the principle of it. So everything that happens has to be contextualized within the principles of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet and his imams, or the, the imams of the Ahlul Bayt. So based on that, yeah, there was a big I issue. Understand. That I understand, but the interesting, the, I didn't realize that the process of ijtihad means that every innovation therefore needs to be at find it's therefore jurisprudential source and justification, and that makes you much more like Orthodox Judaism. Much, much that makes us much closer to you of all the different Muslim communities. And again, ijtihad is of two. So ijtihad within Shiism and Sunniism is different. What you've highlighted is exactly what, for example, within the Sunni community, the Hanafi community, they would be doing. Within the Shia, again, it's very similar, as you're saying, to orthodoxy in that way. So ijtihad comes from juhad, right? So jihad actually goes back to ijtihad. The ability to struggle, right? There's four sources of, you could say, Islamic or Shia law, which three of them are similar to Sunnis, and one of them is different. Quran. Now, from the Quran, you've got 6,600 odd verses. But from those, perhaps 300 of them deal with law. So Quran is a book of guidance, it's not a book of law. You know, I would say, you know, from an outside, I would say the Torah is a book of guidance, but the Talmud would be a book of law. So in the same way, the Quran is, a, for, for, as an outsider, you know, I'm not an authority, but that's the way that I perceive it, as an outsider. So it would be outsider, more correct if you were to specify the Mishnah rather than the Talmud, because the Talmud's got much more in it. But, the, and the, and, but it's a very good point. Yeah. The, the Rambam's teachings. Uh, so... so is that would that be the case? Rambam codified. So, in a sense, the Rambam is a continuation of the Mishnah, even though it's obviously based on the Talmud as well. The Talmud simply is a much larger uh, compendium. But the Mishnah is purely jurisprudential. The ta the Talmud's got both within jurisprudence as well as plenty of other things as well. And then Maimonides brings it back down again to the jurisprudential. Right. So. so so within us, the Quran itself it would not be a book of jurisprudence. It gives principles. And there, there are no more than 300 that discuss these principles, let's say. Some people would say less, some people would say more. From those principles, then, we then go to the hadith. And the hadith in and of itself, the authentication of hadith in and of itself is a science. So from the hadith, then, we, you contrast it, let's say, with the Quran to see what the principle from that would be. And then after that, we've got so many books which have been burnt. The Mongol invasions, um, over time, the destruction that took place in Baghdad, sectarianism. There are many books that are not there. So we go back to what the scholars would have said, look at, looking at their reasoning. Sometimes they quote books that we don't actually have anymore. Um, and then from that, then, it's the final stage would be the use of the intellect. So whereas within the Sunni school, you have Qiyas. There's a slight difference between Qiyas and Aql the usage of the intellect. And therefore, what do you do find is that there is a, very, a strong tradition of philosophy or logic um, within the Shia school. And we would then use essentially the intellect to say, you know, what did God mean by this? Um, does it fit with the intellect? Um, do we have anything to support that? Now, we can't completely be completely open-minded as well in the sense that our my intellect says this. Well, there could be 20 intellects saying 20 different things. So then it goes back to being authentic with the actual principles. And so from this, we develop what is known as an ijtihadi decision. And when you look at somebody like Ayatollah Khomeini, as, as mentioned, when he developed this concept of the jurist, 
having guardianship. It comes from particular, you could say, chapters of jurisprudence that the jurist has guardianship over, let's say, a widower, an orphan, or property which doesn't have an owner. So again, it comes back to ownership. From that, he extrapolates and he develops a concept. Um, and for other hadith as well, there's, there's a ma'ula, there's something which is um, uh, accepted, the person by the name of Omar ibn Hanzala, there's an acceptance of a particular hadith, which looks at the power of the jurist, and that's not upheld by all of the jurists within Shia Islam, but it's upheld by some. And based upon that, then he develops a system whereby he says, actually, the jurist has guardianship over the entire country, essentially. And so he uses that to overthrow the Shah, to say that, okay, maybe this country, maybe the position of the Shah, but me as a jurist where there's an oppression taking place, I have the power to derail him, essentially. And, you know, and from there, there's a development that takes place, and that may not be upheld by all Shia jurists. Ayatollah Khoi didn't have that opinion, and he was he really the jurist in Najaf at the time. Um, his school is a huge school at the moment. The vast majority of jurists come from his school. Uh, but again, it's an, it's an evolution. It was never meant to be a politics such that people are killing each other over it. It's intellectual. And you know, in Najaf, Ayatollah Khomeini was open for people to come and discuss with him and debate with him. And there were many people who didn't agree with him. So it is, it is an ongoing discussion. And that's what knowledge really is. If I have a disagreement with someone, it shouldn't lead to bloodshed. It shouldn't lead to, it shouldn't lead to bad blood, essentially. We can sit down as individuals and eat together, but at the same time, we can hold differences of opinion. And I think today, that's the big problem. When the world is becoming so polarized, when you find that there is religious extremism across the board and also secular extremism, there's an intolerance there. I find it a big problem. Um, and when I look at my own denomination, this is something that I preach that, look, just because somebody has a different difference of opinion, from you. And I find the biggest problem comes intra-faith. It's not the interfaith issues, it's intra. In, within our faith, within our denominations, you find that we're harsher with each other or to each other. And I find that we need to overcome that. That in the same way as we have acceptance and we're willing to listen to people from across the faiths, we need to listen to each other more. Yeah, we have and, the same problem, absolutely. But that's always, those who are closest to you are the biggest threat to you. Those outside are not really the threat to your own authenticity. No. I am wary of time, so I do want to wrap it up with one final question and feel free to make it as brief or as elaborate a response. But it does seem that the mutuality between both you, Rabbi, and Syed is on the multiplicity of a unified God who exists beyond our metaphysical comprehension. What I find interesting is the question of where there is disagreement on the most fundamental question, perhaps, of the Abrahamic religions, that of monotheism, where there is disagreement on the assumption that there is unity within a single God. And what I mean to say by that is interreligion doesn't obviously exist within the scope of the Abrahamic religions, it attempts to transcend that and attempts to bring in all religions in a way that is conducive. Does it mean that there are different barometers by which to assess either the success or the mechanism of inter-religious dialogue in different contexts? And what do you make of this seeming contingency of the inter-religious dialogue that we've had hinging on the mutual shared belief in monotheism? and extrapolating from that? What happens when you unhinge that assumption and potentially other corresponding fundamental assumptions which may be deeply held? So, I, um, I, may I go first? Of course. Thank you. Um, so, the, the, the first thing I would say is that when the Torah which, as you know, is seen as the system of Verba, the direct revelation of God through Moses to the children of Israel. When the Torah deals with the abomination of idolatry, it is not dealing with a theological abstraction. It's dealing with something that actually had uh, very practical consequences in terms of the way people function. 
and it's inextricably connected to uh, the repugnance of immorality and of a uh, lack of sanctity and dignity that typified such, such idolatrous culture. When, uh, for most, for until the advent of Islam, Judaism had never met a religious community that could be described as an ethical monotheistic community. It had come across individuals who could be described as ethical monotheists, but never a community. And the emergence of Christianity, especially as it came under early control of the Roman Empire, which was seen just the same pagan forces of corruption and of immorality to thunder and other guys, didn't change that. It was only when it encountered Islam that it realized that there was such a thing as a community that uh, not only believed in the one source of all and guidance of all, but lived in accordance with that principle and therefore was a moral community. And uh, in the 14th century, 13th, 14th century, Rabbi uh, Menachem Hameiri of Perpignan, who is very much a basis for modern, if you like, Jewish pluralistic or orthodox pluralistic thought, is the basis for both Rabbi Cook and Rabbi Herzog, the first chief rabbi, incidentally, the first chief rabbi of Ireland, but also the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, um, to be able to advocate for full civil liberties for non Muslim, for non Jews, for Muslims and Christians within a Jewish polity. Uh, and Menachem Meiri refers to nations bound by the ways of true religion. Interesting the language. Now, uh, I referred earlier on to the fact that Judaism's aspiration for universal, uh, for universal conduct known, is known as the Noahide Covenant and has seven principles. It's interesting to note that, that those seven principles do not include any positive commandment to believe in God, which is quite stunning. There is a prohibition against idolatry, and there's a prohibition against blasphemy, but there is not an injunction to believe. I would say generally, Judaism's approach has been very much in sync with what uh, it, the imam mentioned before, which is if somebody doesn't believe, telling him to believe is not gonna make him to believe. There's no point in doing that, but you can, if you like from a jurisprudential point of view, demand of the individual to lead a moral life and a decent life in terms of the individual's conduct. Uh, I would say that if an, in, you know, if an individual is truly living a moral life, they are recognizing ipso facto, even without necessarily being conscious of it, that there is some that there are transcendent values and there's some kind of transcendent reality. So I would say there is such a thing as godliness even within the life. There can be such a thing as even godliness for the atheist. But that's another discussion, and we could get and leave that aside for the moment. But um, 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 in accordance with this, Nachmanides, the great rabbinic authority from the 13th century, envisions Jewish jurisprudence as functioning on two different levels. There is a universal level for all humanity. And even in a Jewish polity, that should be the only thing that the state enforces. This is very similar to, I would say, those Shia traditions that are not seeing Walayat uh, al-Faqi uh, as having political expression, but on the contrary, being something that is actually detached from sanctifying any kind of political authority. And then the way of life that Jews have to lead, which is more demanding, and but also, again, not something to be imposed by the state in that regard. So um, it, the, the, uh, the, the break, the challenge would be for those who, who would, uh, even, even with regards to the question of idolatry, I mean, idolatry today, our sages uh, already in the Talmud have basically, basically more or less said idolatry doesn't exist anymore in the true sense of it. And certainly others go on to it in terms of really believing that an effigy or think and act is actually the source of power in and of itself. But there is still a question of moral conduct and behavior. And therefore, even those who would affirm a belief but function immorally, 
are more, if you like, idolatrous than those who do not affirm a belief, but behave in a morally responsible manner. So the real challenge for in terms of the Noahide covenant would be posed by those who would seek to be blasphemous and would therefore be a threat to religiosity. And the only real challenge in terms of your question that I would see from Judaism would be those who are a willful assault on ethical monotheism. Uh, and there we would need to face the problem. But I don't think that problem arises in terms of the multiplicity of religious expressions, especially if we are to follow Krista Stendhal's principles and to understand the others the way they understand themselves. Now, certainly within, uh, within Advaita Hinduism, and especially Advaita Vedanta, but also within, I would say, generally throughout the Hindu cross-section, no Hindu thinks of himself, certainly no Hindu scholar thinks of himself as an idolater. He understands or she understands uh, avatars or um, the various of the so-called deities as manifestations of the one divine source. Now, from a Jewish perspective, that might not be the right way for Jews to be able to worship. It doesn't make those people in the sense, idolaters in the sense of the biblical or the Talmudic use of the term. And I therefore don't think that that could be applied to any religious expression in our time. So the only real threat would be when religion itself, in its faith and practice, and above all, its moral character, is directly threatened. And there I think we can be consistent without needing to feel that we are making too many uh, casuistic efforts at trying to square the circle. And I think that was quite comprehensive. Um, and I guess when it comes to monotheism, monotheism has various interpretations, but w at least within the Arabian Peninsula, I guess there were two parallel beliefs which were running. One were those who followed the Abrahamic monotheism, who were known as Hanifs. And they upheld that Abrahamic monotheism until the coming the Prophet Muhammad. And then there were those who were polytheists. And uh, as you know, if you've, you've read that there were over 300 idols and put into the Kaaba. The Kaaba itself was built by Abraham. Um, but if you read some of the philosophies of what the polytheists were saying, they weren't saying this is God. They were separating the names of God, the qualities of God. And they were giving it idle forms, so one could say manifestation. But where Islam came, it unified and it said, no, there is only one absolute, and that's the absolute creator. And this is why, as Rabbi has mentioned, when, when I look at, again, now this is from a personal perspective, that when you look at some, something like the Adivata Vedanta, when you look at the Vedantic teachings, there, there is a level of monotheism that resonates from there. It's a metaphysics. You look at the absolute being that encompasses everything. And so it comes down to interpretation that whether you call it God or the absolute being, you call it existence. There's a very fine line between monotheism here and going into the realms of polytheism. That with the absolute being, if the absolute being is existence, we all share in the absolute being because we all exist. So we all have a reflection of that absolute. Now, does that make all of us individual gods? Does that break it down? into such a way, as you can see, there's a very fine line in the interpretation of what monotheism is, can be, and where the lines of shirt, let's say polytheism, we go over to that side. But I think the most important thing is the idea of virtue. What Abraham also taught us, it wasn't just monotheism, but it was virtue, virtue ethics. And I do find that the relics of this virtue ethics is found within Greek philosophy. Aristotle taught virtue ethics, and I think that's very Abrahamic. Um, the Prophet Muhammad taught virtue ethics. I feel Jesus, when you look at something like the Sermon on the Mount, that, that has a level of virtue ethics there. One cannot deny the fact that he's from a Jewish background. So he would have had that virtue ethics in, in, installed into him. So I, see, I think that virtue ethics is very important. And where virtue ethics goes back to are the names, attributes, qualities of God. God is merciful. It's good to be merciful. God is love. It's good to love. Compassion, kindness. All of these things go back to the qualities of God. And I think that's what transcends 
Today, I guess for Muslims, or at least within Muslim philosophies, social order is important. You could be of whatever belief you are. And there's a saying of Imam Ali, actually, just to summarize the saying that says, look, if a Muslim leader is oppressive, that's worse for a person than if he's not a Muslim, but he's just. Because justice is important. And we find that justice, for example, let's say, for example, within Cyrus, let's say, um, how he emancipated a particular nation. He may not have been of that nation, but he was a just person. And that's really the Messianic teachings. And I think when we look at some, some, an individual like the Mahdi, the Mahdi is a person, yes, but it's also a system of awakening the consciousness towards justice, compassion, and love, which is also important. The idea of virtue. And as mentioned, atheists, when they have that virtue, in fact, they don't need to say that I believe in a God. You're actually enacting God whether you realize it or not. Your being is resonating God and monotheism when you're a good person. So for me, it makes no difference whether a person is atheist, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Hindu, whatever you may be. I think for pe your relationship is with God, but within creation, you have a social responsibility based upon virtue. And so therefore, it's not really about a person who's connected to God. That's your connection to God. But it's for, the out for the person outside, it's actually how good of a human being you are. And I think that's really what it is in the 21st century, as it's been in other centuries. I think the most important thing is to be a good human being. And what is a good human being? It's a person who lives a virtuous life. And that goes back to virtue ethics. You know, and I know we have multiple different strands of ethics, you know, from subjective to so forth. There's multiple different strands of ethics. But I think the one ethical strand that joins all of us together is when it comes through virtue, the idea of virtue ethics. And, I, and I, that's really what I would conclude on. For me, whatever your belief is, whatever you follow, I think it's important to show a level of virtue, which is the epitome of what a human being should be. What differentiates us from animals is that virtue, it's our characteristics. And I believe those characteristics are divine.